This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Some of the strongest words Yeshua says in the entire Bible are, away from me, I never knew you. In order for Yeshua to know us, we need to know him. We need to understand who we are and what we stand for as followers of Yeshua and as the leaders and examples he has called us to be. Some very special guests are going to remind us tonight of who we are and what it means to stand up for biblical truth. And that's why it's your responsibility now more than ever because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Tonight, we start a very special new series that is all about prepping, revelation preparation. We're going to cover all kinds of things from emergency preparedness to the spiritual root of things happening right now in our world. Things we need to keep our spiritual eyes open to, to recognize. Keep your eyes on the calendar because we're into a new year as well, a new month, and a new month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. It's the first Shabbat of the 11th month, also known as Shabbat. Now let's talk about uh, what we have in store for you this month with our partner services leader, David Robinson. Howdy. Howdy, how are you, David? Good to be here. Good, good, good to have you. You know, you are uh, actually doing a teaching in this series as well in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Very happy to have you, and uh, we're gonna be talking about, we won't give away the, the prize, but it's all about <laughs> all about hunting. You, you're, you're a yeah, hunter. I'm, yeah, I'm an avid outdoorsman, and um, and I, I, you know, I think I talked about it on the Hanukkah teaching that always, uh, my wife says that this is the only time of the year I like to go to the grocery store because I go hunt and go, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. Oh. You know, because <laughs> I believe that's the way we should be eating. Right. More. You know, yeah, the grocery store is in the woods. Is in the woods, the yep. way God intended. Exactly, yeah, we're gonna be talking about all kinds of things about patriotism. Why are we gonna talk about patriotism? Isn't that political? No, it's not political. No, not at all. Because it's all about knowing who you are. Exactly. I mean, everyone can see it. I don't care what side of the spectrum you are on as far as how you vote and that type of thing, but you can see that our country is going down. Mm -hmm. You can see that other countries are all having massive problems more than we are right now with this whole thing that's going on in the world. And we need to stand up for who we are. We really do. And, and the, the thing of it, in the time we're in right now, uh, and the the knowledge of seeing apathy that is set into the body of Yeshua, um, we do need to know who we are. You need to make up your mind. Either are you on this side or this side? Are you, um, are, don't be lukewarm. Don't be in Laodicea right. in the spiritual realm, if you will. But we need to know who we are and we and who we profess to be. Mm -hmm. We need to stand up and be that. Right. There needs to be uh, no fear in, in letting people know that you are a, a follower of Yeshua uh, and that you stand for biblical truths. Don't be embarrassed about that. We need right. to stand up now. Absolutely. And then we can come together, we can unify, and we can stand against the enemy in these days. Absolutely. I mean, if people are looking at what's going on in the world right now and looking in the book of Revelation right. and not seeing a correlation, I'm sorry, you got your head in the sand. Yeah, you know, and the scripture says a man, uh, what does it say, if a man doesn't provide for his home, for his household, his family, he is an infidel. He's right. seen as an infidel. So we know that the Bible tells us and teaches us and forewarns us of the, of the days that are coming. We also know in the end that we're not really talked about as a nation. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be something that happens to this nation. We would be fools to, uh, it's, it's just great we're talking about this prepping stuff, mm -hmm. because we should prepare uh, and you can pray about it and determine what level of preparation, but we do need to prepare for our families, whether it's because of hurricane, tornado, or because of civil unrest. Right. So we need to be ready, you need to prepare. Absolutely, now some people might say, well, wait a minute, I thought we taught Bible on this program, what's the preparedness <laughs> stuff? Well, guys, you know what? Michael Rood asked that we do this series. Mm. He is fully aware we're doing this series, he is in favor of this series, and in fact, we've delivered some prepping uh, equipment to his home just recently because they are aware, they're keeping their eyes on up, uh, and so yeah. should you. Because the Bible says, behold, I send you as sheep 
in the midst of wolves. Right. There be, therefore be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we're not, a, don't go out there being a vigilante, but be right. out there with your eyes open, your spiritual eyes open. Ask Jehovah to show you what's going on in the world. I'm sure he's gonna reveal things to you and say, right. you need to get ready. Here it comes. Yes. So that is what this series is all about. And, and the stronger we become in our, the profession of our faith, in the unity of the body, we will be able to stand as a, a remnant. We'll be mm -hmm. a remnant against the things or be able to stand as a community against the things that are coming. Indeed. One of, our, one of my favorite people uh, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't realize he was a patriot. And yeah. before the cameras came, came on, we were just talking about this. His name is John Schneider. Mm -hmm. and John Schneider, I know that name. Where's that name from? Right. Well, if you watch Smallville in the 90s yep. or if you watched the Dukes of Hazard like I did mm -hmm. in the 80s, he was Bo Duke yeah. from the Dukes of Hazard. He has turned into an amazing patriot. He's uh, seen a lot of hardship in his life. He's seen it all come down and now he's he has a, a, a new wife and uh, she had cancer. They went through cancer together. Right. We're gonna have her story on a health awakening uh, That's gonna in, be really in January, yeah. yeah. And they just talked about their their journey as, as patriots in this country. And I think we really needed to have this as the first show in the series. So they are going to be, uh, right after this, you'll see them uh, talking about uh, being patriots because like you were saying earlier, it's important to know who we are. You've gotta make a stand. You have to. You gotta decide what side you're on because if you don't decide, you're on the wrong side. Right. You need to make a side for righteousness and, be, and standing for righteousness and taking chances I mean, that's just what we need to be doing as yeah. believers. We're not to be just hiding away. We're supposed yeah. to be out there. Did, were, were any of the disciples, was Yeshua hiding in the corner, not making decisions? Yeah. No, they were out there standing for righteousness that's no matter right. what it costs. Absolutely, and it says in the end times you will be able to tread on scorpions and so forth. So we have got to unify as a body. First, not to run to the hills and hide, no, but to be a light because we will be empowered. If we believe this book that we are working for mm -hmm. each and every day, then we have to understand that we will be empowered. And it's gonna to be to help others. It's gonna right. be to bring others into the circle. It's not to hide in a cave and and eat beans and, and rice right. and wheat for the next 10 years. Right, it's this not is that. not about bugging out. Right. This is, this is quite the opposite. You might find that surprising. We kind of found that surprising when we first started getting into the series going, huh, this isn't going to be about bugging out like maybe right. we first assumed. All these experts that we're bringing on are telling us bugging out is, it's, it's, an, it's a neat fairy tale that you might see in the movies and movies yes. like Legend or things like a this. A military term. Military yeah. term, but right. the, you need community and we're gonna get more into that. So first of all, here's what you're gonna be in store for tonight. Here's a little clip of John Schneider. Take a look. This is not politics. This is not something I believe and it's okay if you believe something else. No, that's not what that is. That's not what this is. All right, so there you go, John Schneider. He's gonna tell the story of the Star Spangled Banner. I love this story. He told this at the Truth About Cancer conference in 2021 that mm -hmm. I went to uh, and I said, John, you gotta come on my show and you, you gotta talk about this. It, it's, it's amazing. I love the way he tells it. So you're gonna love it. So uh, another thing you're gonna love is our love gift this month, brand new. Uh, it is the Gospel of James. Now, speaking of things that people don't often think about, like prepping, who thinks about the Gospel of James? It's not right, in the Bible, right. but it answers questions about John the Baptist's early life. So you're gonna get that. It's uh, with Miles Jones, and we're gonna be talking about that uh, in the teaching this month. So you get that with a gift of $50 or more. And with a gift of $100 or more, what's this in front of you, David? We have this nine, nice fine piece that's handcrafted. Uh, there's an individual in Eastern Montana that uh, made these for us, and it has the name of God, Yahovah. Right, and this is Montana pine. Montana pine ah, with a beautiful. nice gold. Uh, and no, do not melt this down. It's not <laughs> gold, gold, but it's don't get gold too, colored. Don't get all prepper on us. Don't get right? prepper on us. <laughs> Start melting gold. But uh, this is a really nice piece. Yeah, you a can lovely, have it. lovely person that makes this. And it's and it's and it's, um, it's shellacked or whatever on the mm -hmm. outside, so you can hang it outside. You hang can it hang outside, it inside, wherever. Yes, exactly. A beautiful thing. So that's for your gift of $100 or more plus the teaching. And for a gift of $300 or more, you'll get that, the teaching, and something, David, that you discovered for us is this uh, beautiful, take a look on the screen here. It's a beautiful uh, it's like acrylic. like a paperweight. Yeah, acrylic paperweight. paperweight. Yeah. 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 A keepsake kind of thing with the name of God. Yep, All very right. nice piece. Beautiful. All right, so. 
Before we can begin prepping for the end times, we need to understand what it means to stand for biblical truth and to remember who we are as believers and as Americans. John Schneider of the Dukes of Hazard fame is up next, but first, it's The Kiddush with Michael. Stay tuned, we'll be back in two minutes. Of all the gospel accounts, not one was written by a relative of Yeshua, at least not one that we have in today's Bible. There are, in fact, many gospel accounts that never made it into our modern Bibles, the most significant of which was written by James, the brother of Yeshua. Significant because of its details surrounding a family secret about their cousin, Yochanan, John the Baptist. You couldn't come out and accuse Herod or Rome of these things that they didn't want to take responsibility for. Herod was trying to hide this murder. He doesn't want James writing it up in his gospel. Anybody who has that gospel from James himself would be tracked down and killed. In this month's Love Gift Teaching, The Gospel of James, Dr. Miles Jones explains the details of James' fascinating accounts of John, the murder of John's father, Zechariah, and his mother's heroic escape to the hills of Judea. Right now, for a limited time, you can get your copy of The Gospel of James by donation. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you The Gospel of James on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you The Gospel of James, plus a hand-painted wooden wall hanging featuring the Hebrew name of Yehovah. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you The Gospel of James, the hand-painted wall hanging, plus a stunning acrylic keepsake featuring the Hebrew name of God, scanned directly from the Aleppo Codex. These are special gifts from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Don't wait. The Gospel of James is available only until January 31st and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. There is a rabbinic tradition, even a takanot, a law which changed biblical law, that before one eats bread, one must wash their hand with a two-handled pot, a nagel vessel, and say this prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. Nowhere in the scripture is this ever commanded. In fact, the rabbis will plainly say that we are the ones that made it up, and when you are obeying us, you're obeying God. Well, Yeshua said, do not follow the takanot of the Pharisees. Do not follow their man-made rules and regulations. But every time there is bread, every time we can remember what Yeshua said, what he put in place. And we can say the prayer, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And Yeshua said, I am the bread brought forth in the earth. This represents my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, if it's every meal, if it's every Sabbath, you do it in remembrance of me, because by his stripes, we were healed. And Yeshua took the cup, and he said, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari HaGafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood, the broken covenant in which we were offered to be priests and kings, Yeshua paid the price, he renewed the covenant with us and made us priests and kings. And so as often as we do this, we remember this and we reign as priests and kings now and will do so in the future with Yeshua for a thousand years in our resurrected body along with his resurrected body. And we do this in remembrance of him. Shalom.
Welcome to Revelation Preparation. In this series, we're gonna talk to a bunch of folks who can help you get ready for what's coming next and in ways maybe you never thought of before. Our first guests, uh, well, we wanna introduce you to them. Uh, You might recognize them, uh, John and Alicia. John, you might recognize from being an actor, a director, a songwriter, I'm assuming, and a singer. Please welcome John Schneider and Alicia Schneider. Well, how do you do? We're delighted to be here. Thank you for that great introduction. Well, very glad to have you here. Now, folks might remember you, John, from uh, Smallville and also from, uh, of course, my favorite as a kid was the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, you played- uh, <laughs> Of course. Yeah, you played uh, Bo Duke and things like this. And uh, you know, a lot of people might say, well, why are you having John Schneider and Alicia Schneider on this? What, what do they have to do with prepping? And I wanna say that I met you guys at The Truth About Cancer uh, a couple of, a uh, little while ago, and uh, I was really struck by what you're doing and, and what you've come through, and I wanted you to tell your story a little bit. Um, John, let's start with you for a little bit, first of all. Uh, when you came to the conference, uh, they had you tell the story of the Star Spangled Banner. I'm gonna tell you, get you to do that in just a second, but uh, I was thinking of this interview yesterday. I thought, you know, I haven't listened to the Dukes of Hazard theme song in a long time. I'm gonna listen to this. So I went on YouTube, listened to it, and the last line struck me because it was really a refreshing thing. And, and, and it says, fighting the system like a true Robin Day, modern day Robin Hood. Remember that song? So, right. So I'm thinking, you know, your guy's life right now, you're in, you're in Hollywood, you're still doing things of, you know, where people know who you are, yet it's refreshing to see that you are doing things the opposite of what people might expect of Hollywood. Well, yeah, you have to, uh, you have to follow your own truth. So actually, um, in 2011, I left California altogether and moved to Louisiana to uh, pursue my dream of having a a studio and a place uh, to make my own content, really, my own stories, tell my own stories my own way. Um, And found a piece of property, made a movie called Smothered, which is a, uh, uh, they call it a gruesome horror comedy that I wrote and directed. Uh, And then in 2014, met this young lady, when she hired me, she flew to Atlanta. I was doing a show called The Haves and Have Nots. So she hired me to do a movie that she was making. But um, I've never been one that believed you should you should stay in a atmosphere or continue to work with people that you disagree with. Um, I've never been a hopefully this is a word I've never been a capitulator. It's not in my nature. Um, so when, when people talk about cancel culture, they talk about surviving within the Hollywood model. I don't survive within the Hollywood model. I left it. I took my, I took my shovel, I took my, my bucket, and I left their sandbox altogether. And I had a choice. I could go find somebody else's sandbox or I could make my own sandbox. I've always been a make your own sandbox sort of a, sort of a guy. And so is Alicia's that kind of guy too. Thanks. <laughs> She's that kind of girl. Yeah. So um, gal, is that better? Gal is better than girl? Yes. Who knows? <laughs> but um, so when we, when we teamed up, when we met, we've been, uh, we really are, a, a, I think, an unstoppable force um, because we, we don't play with people that we disagree with. We don't, uh, we don't try to figure out a way to maneuver in shark infested waters. Well, sir, I don't think that it's Louder. so much, I don't think that it's not so much people that we disagree with. It is, as an artist, you should have the freedom to express yourself. And so if you're, if you're willing to take the risk on yourself or if you want to continue to try to chase the carrot in Hollywood and what their perceived notion of what middle America or Americana likes, that's a choice. And John and I both um, let go from the system. Um, I always felt like I was a square peg sitting in trying to fit into a round hole. And I think just being an artist and being able to be expressive and have other artists join us, whether they're like-minded or not, but have them the freedom to be expressive, to do your thing. And hopefully that speaks to someone. Yeah. 
I agree. Well, I love it. Well put. I love that your values are that of folks who are looking for truth and are not you know, buying into the current narrative and all the rest of the world. Se it seems like everyone else in the world is doing something else. And sometimes we feel like outsiders going, are you people nuts? <laughs> this, this doesn't equate. Well, they are. They are. They're, uh, they, uh, they're called sheep for a reason. Um, and, and you need sheep. Uh, if nobody's following you, I mean, you need you need sheep to follow people. There are those who need guidance and there are, there are those. Someone has got to be the first person through the woods. And if you're not built to be the first person through the woods, don't go because you will die. There are those of us who are built to be the first person through the woods. So. It's the most natural thing in the world. Like I, I, nobody has said this, and I, this just came out of my mouth last week in an interview. They're talking about cancel culture as being this terrible thing. We need to cancel cancel culture. Well, I go back to Groucho Marx. Why would I want to be? Why would I? Why would I want to be a, a, a member? How did he say it? Why would I want to join a club that would have me as a member? Why in the world? I, I don't I don't mind being canceled by them because I don't want to have anything to do with them. They are out of their minds. They have no idea what people 20 yards from where we're parked on the side of the road want to see, want to hear, want to drink, want to believe. They are totally out of touch with every living human being that does not live on top of another one in a city. They don't get it, but this is the same lamentation that we had back in 1979 when Dukes of Hazard was on. There were three networks and we had two sets of ratings. The overnights, they came out on Monday and then the national ratings came out on Wednesday. And on the overnights, which reflected New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, Dukes of Hazard was killed. But Wednesday, we wound up being number one. So, you know, it's kind of like the presidential polling. Uh, you know, it depends on who you ask, right? So those out there who, who feel like they're being uh, jilted somehow by being canceled by people with whom you don't agree and don't want to play with, celebrate it. Don't, don't be upset about it. Take it as a, an indication that you are doing something right. Indeed, and uh, John, I think that flows right into something else I wanted to ask you, uh, which you did at the Truth About Cancer conference. You told the story of the Star Spangled Banner, and before you do that, I just wanna let you know that after which, when we sang that, 2,000 people in that room singing that song, you gotta understand, I'm not even American yet. I am a green card holder from Canada. I've lived here for 14 years. I had to go through this process the hard way simply because my education didn't line up with what the government said I had to have, and I had to go around about it the long way. So I've done that now. I've got a green card. I'm eligible for citizenship in 2023, just in time, by the way. <laughs> but when I stood there and I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I sang that song with you, when you were on stage singing the Star Spangled Banner, uh, my wife didn't even know because everyone was singing so loud in that room. I had my hand over my heart. I was singing as loud as I could and my voice was cracking. I couldn't make it through the song. I had tears running down my cheeks because I'm so oh, proud wonderful. and I'm so thankful for this song because of how you explained it. Will you explain to us, please, the Star Spangled Banner? Well, my gosh, certainly. Um, there was a man named Francis Scott Keyes who was actually a lawyer and he was uh, negotiating hostage swapping with the Admiral of the British Navy. They were in the water outside of Fort McHenry. There was a, 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 not a dungeon, but whatever underneath the ship was full of United States prisoners. So Francis Scott Keyes was negotiating the swap of British prisoners for them. And the Admiral said, look, I can do that, but come morning, it's not going to matter. And Francis Scott Key said, why is that? And he said, because we have ordered that. He said, you see that flag over there? We have ordered that flag to be removed from that fort. And by morning, or we will blow it up. We're gonna, he said, you see those ships behind us? 
every gun on every one of those ships is trained at that fort. So they have to take that flag down. Pardon me, not by morning. They have to take that flag down now or we will open fire. Well, the, the fort didn't take the flag down, which surprised the admiral. So they started firing on the fort. And when the flag would start to fall, men would run up and grab it and hold it up. Then it was fired on again. The flag would start to fall because all of those holding it up were dead. And this is why we don't let our flag touch the ground. More people went up knowing that they were going up there absolutely to their death, not maybe, absolutely to their death, but they would not capitulate. So the song is, oh say, hey, can you still see by the dawn's early light? Now we're the next morning. Conversation. What so proudly we hailed, what we were looking at at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched. Ramparts are the protective uh, edge of a ship. Or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. What that means, that's where we get our fireworks on the 4th of July. It's not just some reason to blow something up. The only way they could see that that flag was still there and that the human sacrifice was gathered together to hold it up was by the light of the battle raging to tear it down. So our national anthem ends with, oh, say, and by the way, these were the prisoners down there going, is it still up? Is it still there? Does that star-spangled banner still wave? Or, which is over, the king's English, oddly enough, or the land of the free and the home of the brave? So this is a, our national anthem is a question. Does it still wave? Does it still wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? And this is a question only we can answer. The answer must be yes. We must answer that question, yes. And it's only by protecting it as those original citizens did, only by protecting it with everything that we've got, will we keep our country. So that's what I talk about when I, when I do the national anthem. People just think it's a song that you know, celebrities sing and show off with, but it's not. It's a question. It's the most serious question that you can ask and with the, the nonsense that's going on now, it's the most important question of our lifetime. Also, another thing that we should always think about with the national anthem is that if we give up the freedom here, where will anyone go? Mm -hmm. Name one place on the planet where we will go. That's why we have to keep diligently fighting and communicating and embracing small communities and rising up voices. Indeed. Against enemies, these are two very, three important words, foreign and domestic. Yep. We have an obligation. We have a duty to protect that flag and to protect everything we know it stands for. Okay, this is not politics. This is not something I believe and it's okay if you believe something else. No, that's not what that is. That's not what this is. This is patriotism. This is honor. This is protecting a flag and a country that has afforded us the ability to pursue happiness. We must not give that up or like Alicia says, the world has no hope. We are the last great hope. Lisa, you are a rebel in your own right because you had breast cancer. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Stage four. Stage four breast cancer. And most people at that point would say, well, I'm too afraid to do anything else. And I know you had your moment of being afraid, but then you came to your senses. And like you said, you took your oncologist out of the driver's seat and you put yourself into the driver's seat. So that I think is really important as we head toward times where we don't know whether regular medical care is gonna be available to us. Can you please empower us with your story of how you put yourself in that driver's seat? 
Well, one, I think knowledge is power and you should read, read, read. And um, it's great to have the medical side of, of the of treatment, but you really need to understand, one, what they're putting in you. Number two, whatever your disease that you're quote unquote diagnosed with, what does it feed off of? And then what do we need to do to strengthen DNA and wink it, wink it, weaken, weaken the disease, whether it's cancer or diabetes or heart disease? So how do we, so, you know, we're made in, in God's perfect image. And so our bodies have to be deemed on earth as it is in heaven. And if you believe that, then your body, there's nothing greater than God. And so he's giving you the tools. The challenge is, is that we have to get off of our butts, get active, do the research. You know, I believe in modern medicine, but I also equally believe in homeopathic. And I also believe that you really should be in the driver's seat so that you can make the decision for yourself. A magic pill is not going to save you. And that's honestly how I feel about it. And how that looked with her is she was on three medications and one she took uh, took at home the other two were administered uh, she didn't do chemo she didn't Nor do radiation. didn't do radiation didn't do uh, mastectomy um, but she as as her body started to heal it will naturally i believe start to reject the medicine so because she had changed her diet because she was so in tune with what was going on. She could start to feel when her body was rejecting the medicine. So she cut back on it. She didn't go to God almighty doctor and say, please, can I, you know, can I cut back on my medicine? No, she said, screw it. I'm going to take one every other day. And then she started stockpiling the every other one. And cause this is like $3,000 a bottle. Yeah, it's crazy. So, so she took matters into her own hands. And then when the other two medications that were both administered through it, one was through a drip and one was through a shot, started to make her feel bad, she called them up and said, I'm not, I don't want to take those anymore. And of course, she met some resistance, but because the doctors were in the passenger seat, she's not as cavalier as I am. I would say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you want. This is my body, and I'm not going to take that poison anymore. I don't need it. And if I do need it, I'll come back to you. Yep. But I want to go back to the first the first thing you, you said. Um, again, it's kind of like not wanting to to uh, to be a, a a member of a club that would have you join it. Don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily very bad. And the CDC here certainly is proving every minute of every day that they don't know what they're doing. It truly is a practice. So not having medicine available, traditional medicine, which is standard of care, is not necessarily a bad thing. From my perspective, and I've been watching this now, when if it is not available for you, figure out something else. Chances are, you lifestyled or ate yourself into whatever problem you have anyway. If you caused it, this is not a word, you can uncause it. That's what you do from the driver's seat. Okay? So Alicia looked at standard of care as a personal challenge to figure out another way to balance her cancer. Well, also, I look at standard of care. This is what the challenge I have in the United States is that if they say standard of care, because that, that was a word that was used very cavalier um, with me, and I don't vibrate at a C level. And that's what to me standard of care means. And the reason why I say that is that mammography is considered standard of care. However, there's sonogram and there's PET scans. There's much better care than that. So they know that, but yet they want us to vibrate at an archaic level. And for me, that's one of the things that I am on a mission about is that we all have to raise the standard of care, including 
using adjunct therapy along with it, but they are operating on things that are archaic and they know it's harmful to mm. us. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I, I understand that, I appreciate that too, because aside from what we do here on this show, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've seen people reverse cancer by doing juicing and vegan diets and all kinds of different things. And so I applaud you. Yep. Congratulations. I, I, I really wanna celebrate, you with, uh, celebrate with you for your, your victory over this. And I know you guys are busy and you're on the road and you actually stopped to do this interview. Thank you very much. So before we go. We did. Hey, I wanna, I wanna throw one thing at you. We got a wonderful, uh, I got a wonderful text yesterday from a young man that uh, about six months ago, friend of ours that's into cars said, hey, Chris, Chris was just diagnosed with cancer and he's going through all this stuff. So I brought Alicia out and she talked to him. I don't know what she said to him, but I got a text yesterday. This is the one you want to get. And this is the one you can have. You who is watching who has has been diagnosed with cancer. He said the oncologist was afraid that it had spread everywhere. But I went in with my CAT scan Three days ago, we just got the results, and either it is so small that they can't find it, or it is gone. Beautiful. This is someone that this, my smile here, mentored. So these are not stories for other people. These are stories for you. If someone in a white lab coat has told you you have stage four anything, or stage three or two or one, all it it's not a it's not a death rattle. Correct. It is a call for you to get in charge. Doctors have thousands of patients. You have one. Take charge, and you too can be texting someone. It's either too small to find, or it's not there anymore. Right. Love it. John, Alicia, thank you for joining us. John, uh, I know you're doing some uh, other interviews today for some movies coming up. Tell us what movies are coming up for you. We have a film coming out called Poker Run, which is a good old fashioned Southern horsepower comedy that makes Canadians want to drive south. <laughs> and uh, that also comes out on Orange Friday. It's me and a black challenger just tearing up the back roads of Louisiana. And it's a lot of fun. So check that out at johnschneiderstudios.com or get my app. I have an app, thanks to this one. It's called John Schneider. You can download it on your iPhone, on your Android, on your, on your laptop or on your desktop. Uh, and it'll take you to the movies and the schedule, the whole thing. Even, which is part of our, our cancer regime, CBD, or in our case, CBOD oil. So uh, that was also something that Alicia did to uh, to regulate and get get back in control of what her body was doing. So uh, we don't have time to talk about that, I guess. But check out John Schneider's C Bow, like Dukes of Hazard. C Bow D. It's moonshine flavor. It's apple pie <laughs> moonshine flavor. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, well, we're gonna have to have you guys back again sometime. Until then, God bless you, keep you, thank you for what you do, and safe travels to your destination. Thank See you, you very, very much. You take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.
welcome again to Revelation Preparation, a series where we are getting you ready for Revelation. But before we can go to Revelation, we need to go back to Thessalonians. So turn with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, where we read, But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they, say, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and travail as a woman with child and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. That day should not overtake you as a thief. You are children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober." So watching the news and being sober is what this series is about, especially with our guests today. Now, to be, to be just completely transparent, we are not talking about whether you took something as a, a medical decision, whether you decided to or not to do it, if you know what I mean. Everyone needs to stick together because the times and the seasons are coming where Yehovah is going to send Yeshua back here and get us all. So we need to be aware of that and we need to stick together and learn about the things that are coming next. But there are some things connected to medical decisions these days that we need to be frank about. So let us welcome our guest today and talk about that. Please welcome Amy Bond. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Scott. Certainly. Now it's Amy Bond, not Bone, correct? Amy Bond, Amy Bond. Yes, okay, that's right. John <laughs> Absolutely. Now, first of all, uh, let's explain uh, who you are and, and what you do, first of all. Yes, uh, I'm actually the, the president of a nonprofit called PERC, which stands for the Protection of the Educational Rights of Kids. And we are a nonprofit that does a lot of advocacy work all across the state of California and also other uh, states in the, the country. So, yeah, we, we focus on protecting the children. We focus on, you know, whenever policies and things come out from the health departments or the, the government or the state, we focus on how that actually impacts actual people. So we dive into a lot of research and advocacy work. And really our focus, though, is to protect children. All right. So with peace and safety, uh, we, we are all told, uh, you know, when, when this whole uh, pandemic started, that uh, to be safe, uh, we need to do certain things. Uh, some people said, yes, I believe that. Some people said, no, I don't believe that. Uh, but we all need to stick together because there's, there's other agendas behind here, I think. And this is why we want to have you on the show, because you are an expert on these agendas, where they come from, how far back they go. And I think that's the key, is how far back they go. It's like, wait a minute, something is not right here. Are we being set up for something into the future? And that's where we get into the things of revelation. And we're being quite serious about that today, where I, I think what we're going to be talking about today is, quite frankly, what's going to lead to the mark of the beast. We need to have our eyes open and see what's going on here. So could you tell us exactly, you know, there's all this push to have um, our genomic uh, identification put out there and then also to do certain things with, with medicine. So it seems like we're being coerced to use medical uh, records for some other purpose. Can you enlighten us there? Yes. Uh, so I agree with you that what's happening right now, there's, there's a whole infrastructure being put in place right in front of us. And part of what we've been doing is trying to alert everyone and talk about it. Cause we think this is actually one of the most important things we can be talking about. So, um, in reality, a lot of the things that I'm going to share with you actually were set up several years ago. Some of them were set up in 2019 before we even walked into these lockdowns. Uh, other companies were set up in 2017. So we're we're actually talking about um, entities that are preparing for something. And I think that we should talk about DARPA and Profusa if if we can talk about those. Sure. Next. First of all, DARPA. Some people might say I've heard that acronym before. Where is that from? It has something to do with the government. Right. So DARPA is actually an entity that's under the Department of Defense. So it is part of the government under the Department of Defense. And DARPA over the past 10 years has actually been focused really heavily on biotechnology. So things that are related to our body and connected to technology. And so their focus, they actually, uh, DARPA, people don't realize this, but DARPA actually funded Moderna. So one of, of course, one of the, the shots that's out there, uh, the manufacturing company and DARPA 
DARPA has been integral in actually funding other entities as well, and one of them being a company called Profusa. And so Profusa is actually not only funded by DARPA, but it's also funded by the NIH and also Google. So when you kind of see these three funders of something like this, you have to ask, we have to ask ourselves, what is it? What's, you know, what is Profusa? And so Profusa is actually something related to biotechnology as well. They've created a biosensor that goes under the skin and it's smaller than the size of a piece of rice. And what's really interesting about it and slightly, you know, and we really should be looking into this is this little, this little, uh, a uh, biosensor is made out of some type of hydrogel and it emits this fluorescent light as a signal. And then of course, what we should be asking is what is that signal doing? What is it connected to? And what people don't realize is this particular biosensor is connected to our smartphones. So it's actually able to relay data about our body, temperatures, oxygen, all kinds of things directly to a smartphone. So that, you know, Profusa is a pretty big thing I think we should be paying attention to. And that, uh, that biosensor, I think, is also connected to uh, Microsoft, who, um, who has a patent for a cryptocurrency system. And that cryptocurrency system is also connected to wearable devices. And it specifically says in their patent that it's also connected to body activity data. So cryptocurrency wearable sensors, body activity data. And then of course, like I told you, we have Profusa. So those things are all connected and, 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 and there's more. Start to, I start to feel like an infomercial. <laughs> there's more. Oh no, tell, more. tell us all about it. I mean, that, that seems odd to me that a, a biosensor that could tell you things about your body. So we're t- talking about if you, what, have a fever or something? That, that, that's- I think, yes, I think everything. It Somehow this hydrogel sensor, it, it actually, the capillaries, um, at, like in our body actually interact with the sensor and that's how it's able to read body data. So Profusa, I think is only one part of this. I think you've got Profusa and then you have this cryptocurrency patent that Microsoft has, but then it goes into something I think bigger that's happening right now with the medical decisions and medical mandates that we see and the digital ID. So I'm sure your viewers and everybody's familiar with the fact that there's a a digital ID or health pass that's being pushed really across not just our country or just one state, but across the entire world. And so that is something we've heavily researched. And we have a lot of information about where we think it's coming from, how it's connected to Profusa and the cryptocurrency as well. So they're essentially back in January. There was a working group that was established under the WHO, so the World Health Organization. And under that working group, you know, they had they had hundreds of organizations from across the world that were part of this group. But one of those um, organizations was Microsoft. And the whole purpose of this working group, it was called the VCI. So the Vaccination Certificate Initiative. And that was about them creating these digital certificates or smart certificates that would allow people to be traveling uh, between countries and verify their medical status based on you know, whether they had taken the shot or not. So what you see is in that collective working group, that's the first time we see Microsoft talking about what's called a smart health card. So it's a smart health health card. Think of it as like a, think of it as a smart health app, right? Basically, you know, our phones have all these apps, right? And that particular smart health app is able to create a QR code. So a digital code that verifies people's, um, people's status, whether they've taken the COVID shot or not, the jab or not. And the other thing about this working group is that they had another huge group, a part of this as well. And it was called, it's called the commons project. So have, I don't know if you've heard of the commons project before. No, I, I'm sure some of our viewers haven't either. So why don't we explain what that is? Yeah. So the commons project is a, a huge group that was established in 2019 and, you know, just be ready because that particular group Um, It's actually in collaboration with the World Economic Forum and also uh, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. So we see some pretty big players who have pushed forward this commons project. And within the commons project, 
they actually created what's called the Commons Pass. Okay, so the Commons Pass, part of the Commons Project. And the Commons Pass, what they're using as the Commons Pass is that Microsoft Smart Health Card, that Smart Health app. So that working group we talked about that was established in January is also directly connected to this Commons Pass and the Commons Project and Microsoft. And this, you know, this, uh, this health card app we're talking about they are already trying to establish an infrastructure and put it in at more than 52 countries right now. So this is not something that's just the United States. This is something that's happening globally across the entire world. So, and that's the point of the Commons Pass is they're trying to establish an infrastructure with this verification system using the Smart Health app. And for you know groups like us, you know, we live in California, so we're a part of California. And uh, this this is actually how I discovered it is, is I we were watching our, our nonprofit was looking at these health passes that were going to be required for children. So at some of the high schools and some of the school districts, they were telling parents that they couldn't return the children back to school unless they had the smart, like these health passes, right? And so that was what started to tip us off that, hey, you know, I think we're going to turn over that rock, look underneath it and see. And we started to see there's so much more going on. And those that health pass in, uh, in LAUSD was directly funded and instituted by Microsoft. Right. And then we saw some other things developing in Long Beach School District here in California. And those were also health passes along with these mass genomic uh, surveillancing platforms. Mm. So that's really what launched us into looking into this more seriously. And, and, and every time we keep looking to it, we turn over one rock and we're like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on here. Well, I'm sure, and we can <laughs> talk more about this, but I think people need to understand and remember. I mean, those of us our age, we just, we have to hear it from our parents and grandparents. But the Microsoft of the 1930s and 40s was IBM. And IBM right. had a big part to play with helping Hitler keep track of the Jewish people. Uh, that was a very right. big part of it. Uh, basically what we see today as genomics and profusa and things like this, they had their own, what we might consider archaic technologies, but it still kept track of every single person so that the Nazis would know where everyone was. And it was also uh, tracked under the guise of a health pass, as it were. Right. I'm actually really glad you brought that up because um, one, two things really quickly. When they created this working group I was talking about from the WHO and had all these entities, Microsoft, you know, the Commons Project, all of that a part of it, they actually did several presentations and we, you know, they're very boring to watch. So we had the opportunity to listen and watch them uh, for everybody's sake. You're welcome. But what, you know, what happened is in their own presentations about these smart verification systems, this, these apps, they actually said something that I think is very concerning and really applies to everybody, regardless of your stat, your medical status, and regardless of the where you stand on the issues related to the shots and you know all that stuff. But this is what they said. They said that the they said that they can't prove immunity, and that the purpose of these certificates was just to prove that you had actually had the event. The event actually occurred meaning that you got the shot. So there was no, there's no proof of immunity. It's about the event occurring and putting you into this data, this, like you said, you know, these data systems um, that are following and tracking everything. And, you know, along with that too, I, I think we should also talk about Azure because the smart health card is directly one of the apps under another big uh, umbrella for Microsoft called Azure. Now, what is it, Azure? Yes. So great question. So Azure is basically, think of it as an umbrella for a lot of things related to the internet. And in fact, they call it the internet of things. That's something people should be watching for that terminology, IOT, internet of things. But essentially think of it as, you know, it's basically a whole system in the cloud. Like it's a whole umbrella of, you know, Microsoft has this Azure that's a, that's a health cloud, basically, an IT system. And under that, that's where they've produced the smart health card that we're even talking about. 
And in their own words, again, I like to just take it straight from them. I don't have to recreate it. I'll just, you know, quote them directly. But they actually talk about an AI technology with the Smart Health app that is able to sense whether people are wearing a mask or not just by your by the phone and can actually sense body temperatures. So that type of technology, you know, I mean, like this is just something I think way more than people realize. It's way bigger than people realize. And Azure is another one of those entities that was established in 2019. So it was launched in 2019 prior to lockdown, prior to any of that. And um, the Azure is working with Africa, the continent of Africa. And according to their own, you know, press releases, they actually refer to this system as a real time genomic surveillancing. So somehow it has the ability to monitor in real time people's, you know, everything. So I I think people really need to be waking up about this from everything we've seen. This actually isn't even about the shot. You know, a lot of, a lot of people talk about that. This is, this is why it, it's, it impacts all of us and it's relevant to everybody to know this information. You know, they're calling these digital passes, lots of different names, you know, the green pass, health pass, digital ID, um, certificates, health cards, right? So they're calling them a lot of different names. But the point of them are what the what is the point of even having them? And it really is a whole infrastructure being put in place that controls surveillances and tracks everybody. And it's not just about our medical status. It's not just about that medical decision. It's actually controlling people's travel. It's controlling people's education, whether they can be in schools or not. It's controlling people's job and their work. So what, what's left, you know, it's bank accounts, you know, there's other things, food, there's things that aren't quite controlled yet, but if everybody is pushed into this type of infrastructure and system, a digital system where we're all tracked and we become a digital commodity really in this new infrastructure and system, then every single thing we have access to is going to be controlled based on our medical status and whatever other what what's out? What else? Indeed, for right? for our for our peace and safety, we mm-hmm. it may be that we cannot that our digital currency tied to Profusa in our hand will not work anywhere five miles from our house, for example, because they want to keep everyone separate and everybody just stay where you are, and and that way we'll have safety. And you can see how this can quickly get out of control by those who uh, should maybe not have the power over over our lives. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing about it too is, you know, here in California and other places as well, you'll see this in Europe and Australia, but the way that they're, what they're doing with the people is they're actually creating medical segregation and they're separating people based on their medical status. And when they're doing that, what they're doing is they're actually pushing one group out of society. Like we have to understand that that's how serious it is in LA County they tried to pass an ordinance, which of course it's unlawful to do this and it's discriminatory, but they try to pass it anyways, where people cannot go into indoor spaces. You can't go into restaurants, spas, uh, you know, f- facilities, gyms, you name it. And you can't go in there unless you have received the COVID shot, right? So again, it's not even about the shot. It's the fact that you're separating people out of society based on that medical decision, right? So, and it's just a matter of time where people, regardless of what choice you've made on that medical decision, it's going to impact everybody. I mean, it already is. But like, why should one group of people be opted out of society? Of course we shouldn't be, or or they shouldn't be, but that's what we have to wake up and see, that that's where this is going. Do you want your neighbor, your coworker, your um, your friend's children to be completely pushed out of society because that's why it matters for everyone to stand up uh, and understand what's happening and stand together in solidarity. Well, I hope that, yeah, indeed, solidarity. And I hope that everyone recognizes that this has nothing to do with health. This has to do with, are you going to be compliant or are you not? Well, go, you, can, you can go look it up for yourself. It's all right there. This is all really happening. And we should be very discerning of why are they creating a cryptocurrency 
and patent connected to body activity. And they, we also have this, you know, this biosensor, like we need to be asking those questions. Why are, why is that there? Why are they pushing this? Why are there mandates and coercion where they're trying to force people? And I think that's where we can step back and say, hmm, this is so much more than just health, like you said. Indeed. Amy, thank you for joining us today. Where can people go to find out more information about what you do? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So they can go to our website. We uh, have a, a great website. It's called uh, perk, P-E-R-K, dash group. Dot com, and you'll see that we actually have several lawsuits uh, out there because we're part of our job is to really contend with the things that are happening, protect the children. In LA County, we have a lawsuit that uh, is actually, we have over 5,000 people in that lawsuit, uh, first responders, public employees, and we're doing that to to push back against the mandates and the things that are, you know, that they're trying to force people to lose their jobs. So we have a lot of good stuff up, up there on our website. All right, well, thank you very much. I know we just scraped the tip of the iceberg, but <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk again. Thank you for what you do. This is not the end of what you do, I'm sure. This is just, like we said, the beginning. Lots of other things to come, especially if what we read in the Word is true, and there's a lot more to come. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for joining us on Shabbat Night Live. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I was It was a pleasure to be here. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.